Hey everyone, you are watching or listening to the Run It Back podcast, the place where we have real and raw conversations that are relevant to your life in Christ. I'm Jeff, that's Parnell, and this is episode seven. That's right, seven episodes in. This week we are talking about racism. But before we dive into that conversation, do us a favor. If you're watching us on YouTube, hit that subscribe button right now. We're over 100 and we're going forward. So hit that subscribe button. Make sure you hit the bell icon so you get notified every Friday morning at 6 a.m. when we go live. Also, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, give us a review. Share this with somebody that you love. We want them to be part of the conversations that we're having. Parnell, we promised when we got started that we were going to have conversations that maybe weren't comfortable, but they were critical to our lives. And this one's going to be another one of them. We've talked about pornography. We've talked uh, about abortion. We've talked about comfortable Christianity. We've talked about homosexuality. Tonight, we're talking about racism. It's a, a topic that affects so many people. And it's based on this conversation I did was based on the horrific shootings um, and the murders that happened in Buffalo, New York, where 10 people were brutally murdered by a man who said he was a white supremacist. Parnell, I know racism is something you've dealt with growing up as an African-American man. Uh, when I t- say the word racism, what comes to your mind? Yeah, it's a word that um, I'm all too familiar with growing up. Uh you know, I remember being called uh, the N word at, at five years old. You know, jumping off the preschool bus, and and uh, I remember running into my grandma's house where my mom was and asking her what this word meant. Uh, and it wouldn't be mm-hmm. long after that I would quickly become familiar with that word because it was something that I uh, was called every day. Um, you know, my family and I uh, grew up in small town Iowa, and you wouldn't think in this kind of area that we would experience a prejudice in a Midwestern state, but, um, you know, prejudice and, and racism is something that, uh, is prevalent. It happens, uh, everywhere. And I'm really thankful that we're, we're having conversations, you know, uh, about it because the more conversations we can have about the things that uh, people are dealing with and struggling, the more understanding that we can begin to develop and the more empathy we can have, it's a tragedy. Ten people lost their lives, and the motivation was racism. You know, and this is this is a statement that you've heard quite a bit, uh, and a statement that offends a lot of people. But I'm not, <laughs> I'm not new at offending people, so <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and, and continue the trend. But you know, at the end of the day, racism is is sin. It's a it's a sin issue. Yeah. You know, and um, you know, so it's a topic that's that's near and dear to my heart because I've had to overcome prejudice. But I think about this, Jeff, I think about Matthew 24, uh, 12, and it says, because lawlessness is increased, most people's love will become cold. And that's a perfect depiction and description of what we're seeing. We're seeing the love of people growing colder and colder by the day. You know, speaking as a Caucasian man and growing up in rural America where there weren't African-American families around, I, I've told you, Parnell, I vividly remember being in middle school when I saw a black family drive through town and it was like a spectacle. Like I'd never seen people whose skin color was different than mine. I was ignorant uh, to black people and the differences, but also the similarities that we have as well. It was just an ignorance thing. And so I think a lot of what I understand and what I experienced and what I see is ignorance from people. Uh, We don't get to know each other. We don't honor and respect each other. And we've been having conversations about not honoring and respecting each other from the womb all the way up to, to death. Like we don't honor each other. And so it's no surprise that when it comes to our differences, we don't love one another well, and we don't get to know each other. And, you know, something that I've loved about this journey in my time here in Iowa is getting to know you, someone who's very different than me, but yet very, very the same as me. And when we sat down and had breakfast that first time, when we got to know each other's hearts, Mm -hmm. uh, immediately we had a bond uh, that to this day has been a special one. And you're one of my very best friends. um, And it has nothing to do with what we look like. And it has everything to do with our hearts. But wouldn't you say that there is racism because we don't love one another. And we really don't even spend time to get to know each other. We put each other in a stereotypical box and we leave it right there. I'm so glad you said that, Jeff, because, you know, I believe the things you don't understand, you fear. The things you don't understand, 
you fear. And so you have oftentimes a, a lot of, a lot of Caucasian cops or white cops that are, you know, you showed me the video not too long ago of the, the shooting in Michigan, this, this, this cop who brutally execution style killed a, mm-hmm. a black man who, who didn't pose, um, seemingly that great of a, of a, of a threat. And so you have fear that's at the core and at the root mm-hmm. and at the center of all of this, you know, racism in general, whether we're talking about uh, blue lives in terms of cops, which I have many cop friends and many friends that serve on our uh, police departments and sheriff's department. And then you have, uh, uh, you know, a minority who whose heart is absolutely racing when they get pulled over by a cop, whether it's in small town Iowa, whether it's in a big city, they don't know the kind of experience that they're going to have when they get pulled over. So I know we're not talking about, um, you know, police uh, enforcement and, and, and law and, and the type of shootings that we've seen over the last couple of years. But again, I, th- I think that misunderstanding and the lack of knowledge uh, and understanding leads to fear. And we have people acting out out of fear because they don't understand one another based on um, many reasons. And I think a lot of it, Jeff, too, is learned behavior. This stuff is being passed down mm. from generation to generation to generation. And folks don't even understand why they're, why, why, why they're calling uh, black folks the N-word. Uh, and oftentimes it's because, well, you know, that's what they heard uh, daddy say or their, grand, their grandpappy say or whatever the case may be, right. you know. And the same goes with kids in the hood and, 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 and kids that grow up in the street. You know, a lot of it's learned behavior, you know, and so you have a you have a gamut of different reasons why we have the violence, racism, and prejudice. But I think a big part of it boils down to fear, and even deeper than that, I believe sin. That's interesting that you brought that up. I've never thought about a generational curse when it came to racism, but you're exactly right. Like if you're never around someone of a different race, if you're never around someone from a different socioeconomic status, um, then you think about them a certain way. And when people in your proximity talk in a certain way and that's all you hear, and then you're not around those people to know any different and you're ignorant, um, then I can see where you very easily fall into that trap. And you fall into that racist trap or that ignorance trap. And um, it all goes back to the heart. This is interesting. This afternoon, I was reading some articles and I sent one of them to you, Parnell. This is the Buffalo Police Commissioner. I don't know if he's a person of faith or not, but it was interesting what he said um, about the suspect. He said, this is someone who has hate in their heart, soul and mind. Hate in their heart. Mm -hmm. God told us that everything flows from our heart. It's our most valuable possession. And he also said that it's the thing that matters to him the most. I look all the way back to 1 Samuel chapter 16 when David's being anointed as the next king and the prophet Samuel's there to anoint um, the next chosen one by God. And, And look at what the Lord said to Samuel, 1 Samuel 16, 7. He says, the Lord does not look at things people look at. People look Mm. at the outward appearance. Isn't that what we're talking about today? We judge each other on our outward appearance of how we look and our differences. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And the issue with almost everything that we talk about, all these different sin struggles, you know, fill in the blank for the conversation of the week that we have on this podcast. It all boils down to a position of the heart, a sin issue everything branches off from there. So when we talk about racism, it all comes down to your most valuable asset, your heart. And the issue yeah. with this young man who committed the murders and who says that he's a white supremacist and and wrote this long, you know, writings online, uh, his issue is in his heart. And yeah. our issues when we don't respect each other, when we don't love one another, when we don't get to know each other, when we um, create stereotypes based on how someone looks or what we think, it's a heart issue. And Everything in this life flows from your heart. We have ugly hearts. And without yeah. the Holy Spirit, without the cleansing that comes inside of us through that work, um, we can be very ugly people. Yeah, think of the position of Martin Luther King Jr. You know, like talk about a man who had the Holy Spirit like living in him to be able to respond in the way that he did in a time where racism <laughs> was at right. its absolute pinnacle, you know. You know, I think it's funny because right. I, you know, outside of the shootings and those 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 tragedies that occur, you know, 
on a smaller scale, there's people that complain about racism, and yet you have people, you know, generations before us who who literally lived through segregation, right? Who who yeah. were so closely yeah. connected to slavery, like we don't really know what racism and prejudice is to the degree that the pioneers before us uh, knew it, you know. And when I say pioneers, I mean all people who were in that time and experienced it. But yeah. look at this quote by Martin Luther King Jr. He writes, people fail, and just kind of touching on what we talked about earlier in terms of fear, but Martin Luther King Jr. wrote this. He wrote, people fail to get along because they fear each other. They fear each mm. other because they don't know each other. They don't know each other mm. because they have not communicated with one another. And so yeah. at the core of this is just this lack of this lack of understanding. Like I said, learned behavior. Um, there was a rap song not too long ago that I can't I'm trying to think of the guy's name. Uh, uh Joiner, I think the last name was. And basically it gave two perspectives, one from a from a white cop, the other from a from a black man, and they were able to share each other's experiences with one another. And at the end of the song, there was mm. this level of camaraderie with one another. Look at our like look at our American soldiers, right? Look at look at you know those soldiers that served in Vietnam, different colors, different ethnicities, different creeds. But I tell you what, when they stepped on that battlefield, they better have mm. had one another's backs. And that came right. from a shared experience. And that shared experience, as tragic as Vietnam was and the different kind of war uh, experiences and stories as there were, those experiences brought people together. Why? Because they began to communicate. They began to understand that maybe they weren't so mm. different after all. And so, mm. of course, the enemy is going to use racism to divide. That's what he does. You look at Revelation right. and the picture of all of us in heaven once Jesus returns and we're in eternity with him. <laughs> it's going to be different cultures, different creeds, different nations, every yeah. tribe, every tongue. It's a it's it's a beautiful it's a beautiful picture and we need to start especially those that are watching that are believers, we need to be more kingdom minded. I'm so tired and this is again, I don't I think I said it before, uh I, I tend to offend people, right, with what I say, and so I'm not going to stop that trend now. <laughs> I'm tired of hearing about a black church. I'm tired of hearing about a white church. Mm. I'm he tired of hearing about Hispanic church and this and that. God's not coming back for the white church. He's not coming back for the black wow. church. He's not yep. coming back for the Hispanic church. He's coming back for his church, those who worship him in spirit and in truth. God's love is for all mm. people, regardless of your race, ethnicity, and eternal life is for those who who believe in him it doesn't matter your color. Yeah. And so um, the enemy uses racism as a divisive tool to separate. And so the, as believers, when we recognize that, when we see that we can then begin to defend against the, the tools, the tactics and the, and the, and the arrows of, of racism. Man, that's so good. That's so good. My friend, like, and who's going to take the first step toward that unity? You know, it always takes someone to be the first person to move forward toward the other person. And so I challenge Christians, um, if you're a, a believer in Christ, I challenge you to take the first step to get to know someone different than you. And tonight we're talking about um, race, but it could be anything. Someone that is richer than you, poorer than you, someone that goes to a different denomination than you, um, someone that's older than you or younger than you, to be the initi initiator of that relationship to take the first step to say, I'm going to get to know someone and to, to be intentional about it. And as we talk about race today, I encourage you to get to know someone um, that is African-American, someone that is um, Asian or just someone that is different than you, like invite them to dinner, get to know them, just go be a blessing to them, have a conversation, engage them in a conversation. And what you will find is there will be a lot of similarities um, that you share together. So many more than you than you would even guess. And the things that make you different are beautiful. They're things that God um, designed in all of us um, as part of his creation. The inside of us, are our, our internal heart, our internal, um, the parts inside of us that, that God created um, in his image, those are the same. Those are the same. Yeah. Um, it's the other things that make us different. And that shouldn't be enough for us um, to hate each other. Amen. We should actually appreciate those differences and unite on the thing that we have in common. 
My biggest pet peeve is when people say, I don't see color. When I look at you, I don't see color. Hogwash. <laughs> that is the, that's the most ignorant bull, statement bull. you can, you can, you can make. Man, like, you, we need to yeah. appreciate color. It's okay to see that, that, that someone's right. diff, different. Yeah. You know, that's a beauty, that's a beautiful Come thing, yeah. you know? And so, you know, I think about mm. this, okay? Going back to Martin Luther King Jr., you know, he said, he, he said, um, hate, hate doesn't drive out hate. Only love does that okay so i'm misquoting mm. i probably got a couple words words wrong but love is what drives out hate think right. about this love right. we can only love from an authentic place when we're abiding in jesus because when you love your enemy it it, it comes from a place that only god can provide for you so in matthew chapter 5 verses 43 through 48 he says this jesus said you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may prove to yourselves to be sons of your father who is in heaven. For he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good. And he sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Even tax collectors, do, uh, do they not do the same? And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what more are you doing than others? Even Gentiles, do they not do the same? Therefore, you shall be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. God calls us to love our enemies. Think about Jesus on the cross, right? The, the very individuals that persecuted him, that beat him, that whipped him, that made him to where he was unrecognizable. What did he say? He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Right. Love, love is not easy. But when we love, mm. when we love through the lens of Jesus and we love because we're abiding in him, it makes it possible to love our enemies. Love isn't easy, right. but loving with the love of Jesus makes love possible. And could it be if we would respond in love that that begins to turn the hatred in someone's heart around? It's hard. Mm. Can you think about this? Is it hard to, 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 um, is it hard to hate or is it hard to dislike someone who authentically loves you? <laughs> I would venture hard. to say yeah. I, I would venture to say it, it, it yeah. is. And so it's not an easy place to land someone that's persecuting you, someone that's ridiculing you, someone that is I, I, I've, like I said, I've experienced racism my whole life. I was that kid in the third grade. I may have mentioned it before, but that was rubbing his skin with an eraser because I wanted to be white like everyone else. I didn't understand mm -hmm. what it was like to be around black folks. So here, here I am you know, you know, early eighties to late nineties without having a whole lot of experience being around black folks. I moved to Orlando, Florida, and I have even me have, the, you know, as a minority have a misperception on black folks. I meet this big dude. His mm. street name was, was poet and he was from the hood. And I'm like, Oh, he's definitely a gangbanger. You know, this individual was one of the most intellectual individuals <laughs> that I had ever met in my life. And so our level of mm. misunderstandings about and toward people, it's not limited to just black and white, but it's also, it's also uh, for those who are black that don't understand white folks or me as yeah. a minority right. or uh, someone that's biracial, that's never, ex that never experienced what it was like being around growing up with black folks. I had to have a paradigm shift, and I had that when I had this culture shock yeah. of moving to a place that had <laughs> Cubans, Dominicans, Puerto Ricans, Haitians, you know, folks from from uh, uh, all over the world, you know. And so it's a level of, of understanding, first of all, knowing who you are in Jesus, and then second of all, being willing to understand who others are. Man, that's so good. Like, because you even mis misunderstood someone that was very much like you because you didn't know them yet. And that was what I was trying to hammer home later earlier. And that's how you and I became brothers is because we got to know each other. That's and right. so when you talk about love, I mean, love is an action. It's not just a feeling. You know, we, we think, well, I love mm -hmm. someone. Uh, have, have your actions matched <laughs> your words? Yeah. And so when you when you were sharing that scripture, I was immediately taken to a couple places um, in the Bible where we see love and the feet that accompany the love. You think about the Good mm. Samaritan. Uh, what did he do? He saw mm. someone completely different than him, 
he went to that person. He cared for that person. He invested in that person financially and took care of them. There were feet to the love that's right. that he said that he had in his heart. I mean, there's an action to our love. And that's why I was challenging our listeners earlier. Like if you truly say you want to love someone and have the love of Christ, there's got to be feet to your words. You've got to go out and love that person. You think about Jesus at the well. He had no business talking to that woman. He had no business associating with her, but he goes and he loves her. He invests in her. He spends time with her. There is feet. There is action to the love. And I challenge people not to just use words and lip service or post on social media, but let your life uh, match the words that you're saying. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, I think about the Good Samaritan, you know, what, what happened there? individual responsibility. This is something that you're going to hear me say over and over and over again. And it drives people up the wall because people want immediate action, but they don't want to take individual responsibility. Individual responsibility Mm. isn't, isn't, uh, isn't, uh, it's not limited to your uh, your social media or your Facebook posts or your soapbox posts on social media. Individual responsibility means getting involved personally. Uh, and you never know what kind of interaction yep. that one person has toward another that can change their whole way of thinking. You know, you see some of these some of these cops, and this doesn't get the publicity it deserves. But some of these cops going in the middle of the hood and playing basketball with with these kids yeah. and and doing yeah. all sorts of just you know. So again, some of my closest friends are are police officers, and I'm the same guy. Outside of generally outside of Southeast Iowa, Southeast Iowa, I know quite a few uh, police police officers, so I I generally feel safe if I'm pulled over, uh, and I got a lead foot, so I get pulled over more often than I'd like, you know. <laughs> but outside of Southeast Iowa, you know, if I'm in Podunk, Iowa, and I see those 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 cherries come on, trust me, my heart's racing. I've had some bad experiences with cops, some terrible experiences, but you know what? I've had some great experiences and and some solid mm-hmm. friendships that have been developed. And so we just have to come to this place of, of, of understanding and taking individual responsibility. We're not condoning the violence, the shootings, the, the, the heinous crimes that are taking place, the, the lives that are lost. Like we're not condoning that at all. It's, 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 it's an absolute tragedy. But until we call it what it is, which is sin, and pray against it, go to war against it spiritually, we're going to continue to be frustrated with this sin. But until we a take personal responsibility and love our enemies again, that's so uh, that's so much yeah. easier to say than to do. But that's exactly the place that God calls us to. So my encouragement to folks is to to seek the Lord, pray, 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 pray for the spirit of prejudice and racism to cease in people's yeah. lives. You know, pray for those that are persecuting uh, you. If you're a minority that's watching this and you're experiencing racism or prejudice. Pray for those persons because remember, we don't battle flesh and blood. This isn't a flesh and blood right. battle, and this is this is the kind of that's right. This is the kind of war that the enemy is trying to bait us into is thinking that it's flesh and blood. That's black versus white, it's you know <laughs> brown versus black. All of these different uh, you know all these different uh, racial divides. The battle isn't against flesh and blood as a believer. It's against the spiritual principalities and the authorities and the high places. And until we get on our knees, seek God's face and pray against these authorities, they're going to continue to, to run, uh, rampant in people's lives. Well, I love how you put that because we've talked about how if things are going to change, it's not going to because uh, be because of picketing. It's not going to be because of social media push. It's going to be one-on-one. It's going to be what happens in our living rooms. It's going to be hap- what happens in our conversations in grocery stores. It's going to be what happens behind yep. the scenes. And if everyone yep. is taking their personal responsibility and doing their part behind the scenes, loving one another well, seeking God and praying about it, and doing all that they can do in their world – the world then will change. Amen. It's like a rock that goes out into the water. It just begins to spread out. And we want to see the big impact, the big spread. We <laughs> want to see this huge change in the world. It happens in your life yeah. first. And I think so many times we want to see everybody else change. Uh, where are you at? You know, yeah, that's, a, yep. that's a question I have to ask myself. And that's a question that I ask everyone that's listening or watching. Where are you at? 
Amen. What words are you saying about people that are different than you? Um, what do the people coming into your um, circle of influence or in your friend circle look like? What do the people in your living room look like? Um, I mean, we can get really uncomfortable here if we want to take a close look at how we're living, but I believe that's important. And so if we want to see real change happen, let it start with you. It's got to start with you first. Amen. And our picture of justice looks a lot different than God's picture of justice. And yeah, we may Mm. not, we may not see justice on this uh, side of eternity uh, for those that we wish to seek justice for, but does not God see everything? And is there not eternity to be, to be had? Uh, And so um, nothing, nothing gets by God's eyes. And so the best place that we can land is, is praying praying for those that persecute yes. us and praying, you know, what would it look like if we spent less time complaining about these situations and more time praying mm. <laughs> about these situations? Mm. What, what would, what would change? I wonder that. So guys, we yeah. pray that this conversation yeah. has, has, has been a blessing uh, to you all. And before we go, before we go, I just want to shout out our, our, my, my favorite co-host, and my only co-host, uh, Jeff <laughs> McNeil, and his and his and his bride, his wife Brittany, they just celebrated 16 years of of being married, and so we're gonna do uh, a series here within the next uh, few weeks on on love and marriage, and so you'll get an opportunity to hear yep. from from Brittany Mc, uh, McNeil, uh, and 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 of course my wife Norma uh, Davis. You'll get a chance to hear from from them too, and we'll be. Off air, Jeff and I will be. It's going to be uh, the ladies' time to to dish the dirt, and so it's going to be a good time. But Jeff, I just wanted to say, brother, happy anniversary! You and Brittany uh, set Amen. just such a phenomenal example of what it looks like to love uh, each other as husband and wife, well, and to serve God uh, well. So, happy anniversary, brother! Thank you, thank you, my brother. Appreciate that. Thank you. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, guys, we hope you you've enjoyed this conversation. Remember, like share, comment. Uh, we have reached a hundred people. We're, we're on our way to 200. We're on the road to 200. And so yeah. continue to share these conversations, engage with us. And we, we pray that God would just continue to reveal himself to you more and more until next week. God bless. And we'll see you soon.